So good evening, Northeastern Law graduates. It is my pleasure to be with you tonight to welcome you to your reunion class reception. I hope you enjoyed last night's meaningful tri uh, tribute panel to Ravashi Thad, class of 1983. As well, you, ever you did? No, it's very, very meaningful. As well as this morning's inf insightful conversations with eight of our illustrious graduates and faculty. It was great to see many of you there as I'm sure you know, these types of events take tremendous teamwork and planning. Thank you so much to our reunion committees for each of your classes, for your hard work. It is clear, given this weekend and the range of events and opportunities to reconnect. So thanks to all those reunion committees. We also offer our heartfelt gratitude to the large numbers of you who generously provided support to the school so that our current students may benefit from the same excellent educational opportunities that you enjoyed. Also thanks to our development and alumni, alumni relations team, James Puglios, Lindsay Sedonis, and Mio Marquis for their hard work in reunions this year. Now, the moment has come. It is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts, Rachel Rollins. Doesn't that sound terrific? It just rolls off our tongue, right? Class of 1997, Rachel was nominated for her position by President Biden in July of 2021, confirmed by the U.S. Senate in December 2021, and sworn into office January 10 of this year. Already, Rachel is making a tremendous impact in this role. For example, she is ensuring that skilled nursing facilities across the state cannot refuse care to people addicted to opioids because, as she so powerfully stated, quote, denying access to necessary health care based solely on someone's substance use disorder exacerbates the tremendous damage opioids already caused residents of our commonwealth and their loved ones, close quote. She's also looking into how Florida Governor Ron DeSantis sent apparent asylum seekers to Martha's Vineyard without notifying state government officials. She's very busy. And she is working to ensure equal protection of transgender people under the law, among other critical matters. Prior to serving as our U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts, Rachel served as Suffolk County DA for three years. She was the first woman to be elected DA in Suffolk County and the first woman of color to ever hold the position of DA in Massachusetts. A true trailblazer. Rachel, thank you for joining us tonight. We're very proud of all of your accomplishments and all that we know you will be doing in the future. And we are elated to have you celebrating with us. Please come to the stage. Thank you, Dean Hackney, uh, for your introduction and for your leadership of our law school during a period of incredible social and political change, and through a global public health crisis, you have managed to keep students and faculty safe and purposeful, to drive this institution steadily and thoughtfully in accordance with its mission, and to elevate it into a preeminent center 
for service-oriented legal studies, not just in the region, but also the country. So thank you, sir. Um, to all of my fellow alumni, alumni, thank you for your support of Northeastern, for representing this amazing institution so admir admirably across so many industries, and for the work you do each day and every day improving our legal profession. And thank you for being here and allowing me this incredible honor of addressing you on this occasion. I wanna give a special shout out to the distinguished class of 1997 on the occasion of our 25th reunion. So, you know, I was thinking at home like, my God, 25 years, 25 years. Um, our professional careers are now officially too old to date Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, I mean, but we look pretty good. Not 1997 Kate Winslet in Titanic good, but we look good. Um, and, and it has been a while since we graduated. It is a, a quarter century, right? So we're gonna go down memory lane for a little bit. When we applied to law school, we did not have iPads, no Uber no Instacart, no Airbnb, no Amazon. My nieces don't even know what we're talking about right now. They're like, Was, were there dinosaurs? No, uh, no Netflix. Um, you know, and I think maybe some of us may have been watching My Cousin Vinny on Betamax instead of studying for civil procedure, right? Um, but I will say with Northeastern School of Law, we learned not just by reading books, but by doing because at Northeastern, we do the work. Um, a lot has happened since 1997, but I do honestly wanna take a minute to bring you back there and figure out. Top films in 1997, Titanic, Men in Black, As Good As It Gets, Julia Roberts was in My Best Friend's Wedding, and The Full Monty were like the top movies, like, so bring yourself back to that. In music, Candle in the Wind by Elton John, P. Diddy was killing it. He had like, I'll be missing you with Faith Evans. Um, he also, you know, Biggie had hypnotized. Mariah Carey was singing Honey. I looked up what is a chumba wumba, but then I'm like, oh my God, I get knocked down, but I get up again. Those guys or gals were singing. <laughs> Hanson, Hanson, mm, bop, bop, bop. That was out. Awful, all awful, right? Um, guys. Gas was $1.22. Yes, I double checked it. Um, in 1997, Princess Diana, Mother Teresa, Biggie Smalls, and Versace were all uh, died or were killed. Madeleine Albright was the first woman Secretary of State in our history. Mike Tyson bit Evander Holyfield's ear. <laughs> Tiger Woods was 21 years old back in 1997. He became the youngest golfer ever to win the Masters. The Chicago Bulls had won two of their three in the three-peat. Um, the hairstyle was the Rachel, not my Jean Shallot Afro in the morning, Rachel from Friends. Um, but that is sort of where we were factually uh, or, or in real life back in 1997. And for me personally, I graduated from this great law school and I went on to clerk at the Massachusetts Appeals Court. I got my LLM from Georgetown University Law Center in Labor and Employment. I started an interesting legal career. I was a field attorney at the National Labor Relations Board, an associate and um, ultimately counsel at Bingham McCutcheon, which is 17 law firms ago. It's now Morgan Lewis. I was an assistant United States attorney um, in the District of Massachusetts. Um, I got divorced. <laughs> I became the chief legal counsel to Massport and the general counsel to the Mass Department of Transportation and the MBTA. I went to Harvard Business School. Um, most importantly to me, I became a mom to an amazing scholar athlete and then the legal guardian to two of my amazing nieces that are here today. Uh, I survived breast cancer. And honestly, it was that and only then that I realized to that point, I had had a good career, but I hadn't yet found my purpose. And they say the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you realize why you were born. And I can tell you I was born to do exactly what I'm doing right now. Not just speaking to you guys, but being the US attorney, right, and the DA. 
So in 2018, I jumped into a hotly contested election um, and won, becoming the first woman ever elected DA in Suffolk County, which includes Boston. And had I listened to all of the people who told me, you will never win, there's never been a woman, there's never been a woman of color, there's, you're not, your, your home is in Medford, which is Mid Middlesex County, all the naysayers, I wouldn't have done it. Um, so what I wanna stress to you is that even people who love you and, and want to uh, you, have you avoid failure, um, sometimes failure or the fear of failing is exactly what we need uh, in order to move forward. And, and I can tell you um, that winning that election and becoming the first woman there and the first woman of color ever elected DA in our state was incredibly important um, and meaningful for me. And I fought from the moment I entered that race. I fought misogyny, I fought racism, I fought classism, right? It costs money to run an election. If you are independently wealthy, it's significantly easier. Um, I fought the tough on crime crowd that of course isn't smart on crime and overwhelmingly looks a lot like my beautiful father and less like me, um, 50 to 60 plus year old people that frequently live in West Roxbury, which is nothing wrong with that. And I will never forget, I will never forget in the Netflix documentary Trial 4 when the outgoing DA of Suffolk County said to the media film crew about his candidate, that his candidate was the most educated, experienced, smartest, most qualified, and articulate, one of my favorite words, um, candidate in the race. Um, and objectively, uh, I had more degrees, experience, qualifications, not only than his candidate, but others. <laughs> um, but I did not get distracted. And I focused on knocking doors and doing the work because I'm a Northeastern grad. And that work paid off because I won a crowded Democratic primary with over 40% of the vote and my general election with over 80% of the vote. Um, and we had a mandate and we had work to do. So when I was looking at our class notes in preparation for the reunion, I saw so many of us in, in this particular class, 1997, reflecting on finally discovering our purpose. All of us have struggled, pushed, fought, strived, but we are getting to that point in our careers and lives when we are finally understanding who we are, I hope, and what we are here to do. And I wanna tell you that this is our moment. I know it's exhausting. It's hard work and we are getting old. Um, but, but here's the thing about Northeastern grads, and I'm very serious. We do the work. I answered the call for public service because I was compelled to fundamentally change our legal system. Because I saw how, at times, it could be harmful. It could be punitive. And how little it actually did to help the people that were entangled in that system. I wanted to change the legal system to be more equitable, compassionate, transparent, and accessible. And I ran for DA because I was trying to change a system that was created by and for people who do not look like me, but oftentimes with people like me directly in mind. I have walked in the halls of the very courthouse containing the office I now lead, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Moakley Courthouse, and have been to jails and prisons across our Commonwealth, both as a prosecutor and as a family member and loved one of a defendant. And I bring these lived experiences to my leadership every single day. I know I don't have a lot of time to bend the arc, to make an impact, so I just keep doing the work. I'll be honest, I, I found preparing these remarks a little nerve-wracking. Um, you know, it, it's, it's almost imperative when you speak at a reunion to look into the past. And my family, friends, and colleagues know that I'm not one to often do that and reflect. I am, am and always have been forward-looking, urgent, and quite frankly, impatient. But when, um, you know, I think that sort of set of quirky, character traits has now become an ethos. 
You see, I firmly believe that patience is the method of the privileged. Urgency is the compulsion of those who feel the deep responsibility of knowing firsthand what it feels like to be used or taken advantage of on the one hand, or ignored, forgotten, and overlooked on the other. As well as those of us who feel the immense pressure of being the first and the, the terror of possibly being the last. I know there are so many of you in here tonight who share my urgency. Like me, you chose Northeastern because you know that it is an institution that deeply understands that there are urgent problems in this world that demand urgent solutions. It is an institution committed to empowering students with practical experience so that they can begin to problem solve, disrupt, create, and lead, not from day one, but quite frankly, from day zero, because we do the work. So let me tell you a little bit about the work that I am doing and I'm passionate about. A lot of innovation, disruption, and creativity have happened in those 25 years across many industries. When I skim the class notes, I see, again, so many of you guys leading in your industry. But I have to say that there's not so much innovation in risk taking or experimentation in prosecution. Now, stasis is not always a bad thing. If something is good, there's no reason sometimes to change it for the sake of changing it. When I was confirmed by the US Senate to become the first black woman to leave the United States Attorney's Office in Massachusetts, the headlines trumpeted seismic change, a progressive prosecutor has been confirmed. And I'll be honest, I left the best job I have ever had in my life. And let me be very clear, as DA, you report to no one but the voters. There's no DOJ. For, for DAs, um, there's nothing wrong with DOJ, but I'm just saying, there's a, you're in a, let me be clear, there's nothing wrong with DOJ, but there, you're a hierarchy, you're in a hierarchy at the Department of Justice. I am one of 93 United States attorneys, we report up through the executive office for US attorneys to the DAG, the Deputy Attorney General, who reports up to the Attorney General. As DA, I report exclusively to the voters. And the reason I left, the best job I've ever had in my life is I believed we had a proof of concept in Suffolk County that I wanted to bring to scale. In the three years that I had the privilege of being the DA of Suffolk County, and you are in Suffolk County right now, I created a list of 15 crimes that we were going to flip the presumption on. The presumption was you were always arraigned, we were going 300 miles an hour to arraignment, and then we pulled up the emergency brake and started moving like a slug after the arraignment, right? Three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, continuance, 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 dismissal. Fines and fees possibly, um, you miss a court date, you get a warrant, and you're entangled in this system that we ultimately just dismiss anyways. And people say I have a list of 15 crimes that I don't prosecute, that's not true. We prosecuted a pro Approximately 25% of those 15 crimes in my three years, 25% of them we moved forward with arraignment. But 75% of them, we flipped the presumption to dismissal, declination, or diversion, and we used all of those resources that we were wasting, that was a waste of your taxpayer dollars, to instead of focusing on nonviolent, non serious crimes, to trying to solve the 1,300 unsolved murders we have in Boston dating back to 1960 to trying to focus on non-fatal shootings. Because murder, everyone always looks at the murder rate. Non-fatal shootings are murders that didn't happen. Nobody is shooting and aiming for your clavicle. They are bad shots, they were trying to kill you, and they missed, okay? I'm sorry if any of you were, I hope that doesn't happen to any of you. Um, with my new available resources, instead of spending 70% of our time on those non-violent, non-serious crimes, remember about 30,000 cases a year in the Suffolk County DA's office, 25 to 30,000 cases, 70 to 80% of those are non-violent misdemeanor crimes. I was able to reallocate those resources and create something called the Crime Strategies Bureau, where the narcotics unit, the human trafficking unit, the drug unit, well, drugs are narcotics, uh, human trafficking, juvenile, as well as the gang unit, all reported to each other. They all sat with each other and they shared information. They weren't doing that before. And let me be very clear to you, 
If someone touches the criminal legal system as a juvenile and we fail them, we see them again in narcotics or gang. If we fail them, they might jump right over that and we see them in homicide, either as a homicide victim or a defendant charged with a murder. Or armed assault with intent to murder and that's a felony and they are moving not from district or municipal court, they are being indicted in superior court or we're getting them once they turn 18 in the federal system and they are looking at significant amounts of time. So what I did was I created a Crime Strategies Bureau. I created the first in the nation discharge integrity team where we had four external people helping me look at officer involved shootings. A criminal defense attorney, a community member, a retired member of law enforcement, and a retired superior court judge. We created the Integrity Review Bureau not conviction integrity, integrity review bureau. And that looked at sentencing integrity, conviction integrity, uh, as well as our Brady list and several other things. And in three years, I undid 500 years of wrongful convictions. In three years. And I wanna be clear, people who say we are gonna look at actual innocence Anyone who is a criminal defense attorney or a prosecutor, it is virtually impossible to prove actual innocence. Look at how many cases in the news now where we null process a case and a commissioner stands up and says, we can't prove it, but we know he did it. What? What are you talking about, right? You are not actually innocent. I look at, is this ethical? Were, was the Constitution violated? Is this prosecution so diseased that having and infected that having my name on it is something that I'm not willing to stand by, and that requires bold leadership, which is what I'm, I'm asking of each of you. So the Department of Justice was established in 1870 in the wake of the Civil War to enforce the civil rights and voting rights of black Americans during Reconstruction. In creating the rights of black Americans there, President Ulysses Grant ordered the department to counter and subdue racist groups like the KKK who had been using intimidation and violence to oppose the Reconstruction Amendments. That's the DOJ's origin story, and that's the DOJ that I chose to leave the best job I've ever had to join. And I want you to hear, and thank you, <laughs> equity is not political. Equity is not antithetical to public safety. Equity is the animating principle of the US Attorney's Office in the Department of Justice. It always has been. But there are few things that really had to change if we are gonna make an impact. While the mission remains the same, our tools must evolve. You see, I want us in the US Attorney's Office to be the Ubers, the Instacarts, the Airbnbs, and Netflix of civil rights. These are disruptors that have engaged seriously the challenge of delivering an old service in a new and more innovative and customer-friendly or user-friendly way. I want us to take on that challenge too. The first change that I made was in personnel. And I believe change starts from within. When I inherited this office, there were zero black assistant United States attorneys on the criminal side of my office. 93 criminal AUSAs in my office, zero black. And I told them, you're not counting me as one of them when I start either, because I'm not trying cases. So I am black, check that box, you don't get that plus, okay? Um, and I wanna be very clear, uh, there's one black prosecutor on the civil side. The numbers for the Latinx community, the LGBTQ plus community, indigenous and disabled communities are equally as bad. Uh, there are good numbers in the AAPI community, they need to be better. The second, well, and let me be clear, I've hired 10 people since I started. Three of them are people of color, four of them are women. We hired a veteran, which is also diversity, and we need to be very clear about that as well, right? And thank the people that served our country. Half of those 10, at least, have been defense attorneys. So they are prosecutors, but they also know what it is like to defend somebody. And there's language capacity, and that is just the beginning. The second is culture. 
When I took over the office, I demanded, didn't ask, demanded, that each and every prosecutor in my office is obligated to visit a carceral facility. There was pushback. And then I asked my wonderful first assistant, can you do a survey for me and ask me how many of them have actually ever been to a carceral facility? 80% had never set foot ever, not just like within the last two to three years, in a carceral facility. We stand up every day and ask for people to be held on dangerousness. We ask for bail. You will set foot in some of the places and you need to know where people go when they are federally detained. Right? In Suffolk County, as the Suffolk DA's office, we know everyone goes to the Suffolk County Sheriff's office, you know, department. They either go to South Bay um, or Nashua Street. I'm like, why did I? There's two of them. I should know that. I did. Right? But they either go to South Bay or Nashua Street. There's many different places people can go and they're picked up all across our Commonwealth or outside in, in, in different states or countries um, when we have them. So. That is mandatory, and we are nearly at 100% compliance. And I have made it clear that this is something that when people ask for other things, this is gonna be something we're looking to see if they have complied with in order for them to get you know, salary and bonuses, right? <laughs> things like that. We have to tie things that are important to us. And I like to say, if, show me your budget and I'll show you your values, right? Where are you putting your money? I don't wanna hear slogans and signs. I wanna see what you're actually doing to change things. So we are demanding that and making uh, that important. And to ob obtain that understanding, taking inspiration from my Northeastern co-ops, my staff additionally takes part in nuts and bolt training um, and, and learning, not just search warrant simulations or apprehension simulations, but I have also demanded now that we are gonna hear from criminal defense attorneys and learn from them. We are gonna hear from victims and survivors and learn from them. We are gonna hear from defendants and returning citizens and learn from them, not in a sort of watching them as if you know they're in a cage somewhere watching them. We are going to actually have part of their training requirement, hearing from people that have touched our criminal legal system in a positive and possibly not in a positive way. The third is our tools and tactics. I created a human trafficking and civil rights unit because I wanted to have at our disposal a full set of tools, civil and criminal, to ensure that all human beings are treated with dignity and respect. The AUSAs and paraprofessionals in this unit are responsible for investigating and prosecuting human trafficking, which includes sex and labor trafficking, hate crimes, civil rights violations, and police excessive force claims. I launched a hotline, 183 End Hate Now, for the community to report hate crimes and hate incidents so that we can track and intervene. We've received over 175 calls to that number in less than two months that it has been up. We've opened cases from those calls and some of them were tips regarding the, the, the bomb threat at Children's Hospital that happened, which we have subsequently arrested the individual that was responsible for that. And there is more work to do. So I will say, in my United States Attorney's Office, I am gonna take the ethos I learned from Northeastern and I'm gonna make us do the work. I am so grateful um, to each and every one of you here and to Northeastern for cultivating that in me. I hope that as you reflect on your past accomplishments and your future intentions that you find and hold on to a sense of urgency and purpose because there's one other bit of information I'd like to give you and this is not a complete list but what's happened since 1997 when we've graduated to give you an example of how urgent this work is. With respect to mass school shootings, in 1999 we had Columbine, 31, 13 dead, 24 injured, that's Colorado. 2007, Virginia Tech massacre in, in Virginia, 33 dead, 23 injured. 2008, Northern Illinois University, five dead, 21 injured. Sandy Hook Elementary School, 2012, 27 dead, two injured. Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, 2018, 17 dead, 17 injured. Rob Elementary Massacre, Uvalde, Texas, 2022, 21 dead, 17 injured. That's schools. 
if we talk about targeted communities, we think about the LGBTQ community, the Latin community, we think about Pulse nightclub, June 12th, 2016, Orlando, Florida, 49 dead, 53 injured. We think about the Jewish community and the uptick we have seen in anti-Semitic violence and hatred, swastikas. We, we need to look at Massachusetts and look at our football teams in high school yelling out anti-Semitic plays and calls. We don't need to look in other states to see the hate that is possibly brewing and happening right here. The Tree of Life Synagogue, 11 dead, six injured. That was October 27, 2018. The AAPI community, the Atlanta spa shootings, eight killed, one injured. That was March 16, 2021. Six of those eight murder victims were Asian women. And with the AAPI community, the uptick in violence against them with COVID-related lies. And in the black community, we most recently can look at Topps Friendly Market in Buffalo, May 14th, 2022, 10 dead, three injured. The attack was live streamed um, while we watched that slaughter occur. So I don't mean to end on a negative note, but when I say the work we do is ur urgent and the civil rights work we do is urgent, it's because it touches every single one of us. And our school, more than any other school, not just in the Commonwealth, and I am talking about the school across the river, which we are better than, and let me be clear, all right? We have an obligation to do this work. We have an obligation to do this work. And so, I will say to you that we are going to be better because of it, and I will end by saying, may you age more like Kate Winslet and less like Tiger Woods, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>